June 12, 1994, just after 10 p.m., Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman were viciously murdered outside her condo on Bundy in Brentwood. It set off a chain of events known as the O.J. Simpson saga. Never before have the five key people involved in the timeline of that entire day been in one place at one time, but they are right now. Take a look at the big monitor to my right here. These are the key characters. Of course, Cato Kalin in the middle, Skip Junis in the upper left, who was a witness, Tom Lang, the detective, who was first on the scene of the crime, first to Cato's house, Alan Park, the limo driver, and Jill Shively, a witness who saw OJ leave the scene of the crime. This is One Degree of Scandalous. I'm your host, Tom Zenner. This is a special three-part saga that we're doing on the OJ story during the week of the 30th anniversary. It's brought to you by our good friends at American Hartford Gold. We thank you for that. One Degree of Scandalous, co-host Cato Kalin, right there. You've watched us for 60 plus episodes, but Cato, this one is special. This one is unique. How do you feel knowing, you know, this is the 30th anniversary today, June 12th, 1994. It happened right. June 12th, 2024. Now you see everybody around you. What's your initial feelings? I June 12th, I, people should never lose sight, and I'm sure our, our panel will agree with me, that two young people in the prime of their life, two beautiful young people lost their lives, and that's what the focus should have been on from day one. Um, having said that, uh, I think, again, the panel will agree with, agree with me, it goes by in a blink of an eye. I don't think anybody here will say, 30 years ago, wow, it's a long time ago, it seems like yesterday. It seems just like yesterday, and I'm amazed that it's 30 years that have gone by so fast. A, a panel, you, you agree with me? Yeah. Yep. No kidding. Time, time has flown. We're going to get into all of it here in just a second, guys. Um, the recital happened about 5 o'clock that afternoon when OJ and Nicole were together uh, for their daughter's recital. We're going to cover that in a later episode this week. A lot of details that you may not know are going to come out on that show. At 6.30 was the dinner at Mezzaluna. O.J. and Cato return from McDonald's at about 9.36. At 9.37, Nicole's mother calls Meza Luna looking for her glasses. And then around 10 p.m., Ron Goldman takes the envelope with her glasses back over and... Everything happens after that. So Tom Lang, Detective Tom Lang, the iconic LAPD detective who's been involved in so many of the biggest cases in the history of L.A. crime. Tom, we got to start with you. And it's a Sunday night. And if there's a marquee, high-profile story or case in L.A., you're involved somehow. You have been. You've covered some of the biggest uh, serial killer cases ever. So describe how you got involved initially, why you were chosen to get one of the first calls, and when you learned that this could be something very, very serious that might have legs. Well, it began uh, for me about 3 a.m. Uh, on Monday when I got a call from John Rogers, who was my lieutenant, my boss, and he simply said, uh, the captain would like to buy you a cup of coffee. Uh, we've got a double in West L.A. I was kind of used to this. I'd been working homicides for pretty close to 20 years at the time. And they, they never occur between 9 and 5, you know, Monday through Friday. It's always an off day or late at night or very early in the morning. So you kind of get used to this. Uh, I rolled out to at 3 a.m. And I knew that West L.A. was a fairly quiet area, so a lower crime area for, for Los Angeles proper. To have a double homicide out there was something very unusual. You don't ask a lot of questions at that time. You just get the information uh, and you roll on it, and uh, which I did. And I got there, I was supposed about an hour, hour and a half later uh, to the crime scene on Monday. By the time I got there, they had Monday blocked off on both ends from the south and from the north as well as the alley behind the location, which was good because anytime you have a murder scene, you want to take as much as you can. You never know what you're going to find. So you expand as, as far as you can reasonably, and then you move in. Uh, as far as evidence goes, uh, you never know where you're going to find something. It could be blocks away. So you want to expand the crime scene. And they had that done at the time, which was, which was excellent. The, the first concern was that Bundy was a major 
you know, street on a, on a work day and the following morning, just hours away of Monday morning. So we, Monday would have been closed down between the La Vicente, uh, San Vicente and Wilshire. That would be opened up. And so at that time, if that had happened, we would get a lot of attention. That's the last thing the police want at a crime scene is a lot of attention because it will interfere, frankly, with what you're doing and what you would like to do. And if it's a double, uh, even more so, when you have celebrity involved, of course, that goes up a couple of times too also after, in the end because of the celebrity involved. So we needed to make a decision whether or not to keep Bundy open or whether to keep it closed. We did keep it closed. And this, of course, when the sun began to come up, so did the media. So that became a, a concern, uh, certainly. And they don't necessarily will interfere, but you have evidence around some that hasn't even been found yet. You don't want the media showing up and looking for witnesses yep. like neighbors yep. to, to uh, interview. You don't want them shooting right. evidence that you have at the scene, those types of things. So you have to take all that in consideration. Yep. So I, I think that was the perfect way to start it because let's not lose track of how horrific this crime was. So by Tom setting the scene, when he first got there with his detectives, we all know what everybody was dealing with it. So let's go back a few hours. And and Cato, you were involved in so much of this and all of America and the whole world got to know you during the trial. They got to find out every step you took, you know, leading up to everything. So, you know, the McDonald's run, you know, Cato, I don't see you eat Big Macs. I don't see you eat meat that often. I, so describe to us how unusual the circumstances were that OJ wanted you to go to McDonald's with him. Well, I, di I didn't know it was McDonald's. First of all, I, that's not my choice of restaurants. I don't eat meat. Uh, I do eat chicken, just not red meat. So going there, he was driving and we just ended up at a McDonald's. And it was a McDonald's that was further from his house than there's two McDonald's. But he went to the, uh, I, 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 Tom Lang would know the act actual McDonald's. Yeah, it was, I think on, it was 26, on Santa Monica. Santa Monica and 26. It's still there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So we went to a drive through and he ordered the food. And I ordered my food, which is a chicken sandwich. And he had eaten his sandwich. I think he had two uh, quarter pounders, but he ate the first one like in two bites. I remember that. And we were in his Bentley. And the last thing I wanted to do was this being this obsequious guy, like, oh, I'm with O.J. Simpson. Uh, because let, let's face it, at this time, O.J. Simpson's is this revered person, an athlete that uh, ad admired by so many people. And I thought, Cato, don't eat in the car. So the drive back to his home on Rockingham, I got out of the car, walked right to the door in the kitchen where I thought he'd eat this other sandwich, and he never, never left never left the foot of the car, the door. And I looked back about 15 yards, and I saw him there, and I was like, okay, I overstayed my welcome. I went right to my guest house and ate my food there and never saw him uh, till later with uh, Alan Park. Yep. Okay, so... Um... You know, a lot is being said about OJ's demeanor that night. Something must have happened at the at the uh, at the recital. But as you're going to learn in other episodes this week, there were some other extenuating circumstances. You could see what OJ's background was like. That's going to blow your mind. Where you can see that maybe this was something that was elevating to a point where it could get to this horrible, horrible ending uh, later that night. Um, Cato. Did he, now, you were friends with Nicole. Let, let's let everybody know that. You were very, very good friends with Nicole. That's where the relationship started. When she got back with OJ, she moved into his house, and they asked you to take one of the bungalows in back. So you didn't have a, a super tight relationship with OJ, but did you notice anything odd with him that night? Well, first of all, let me uh, reiterate, Tom. No, she never did move back with OJ. She had a place on Gretna Green. And that's where I live in the guest house. But yes, they started dating again while I lived in the guest house yep. on Gretna Green. So um, I just want to get that point out. And no, I was I was the person that if they and, and by the way, ninety three and ninety four, I got there actually. The uh, I met Nicole in ninety three in Aspen before the New Year's, and my uh, friendship became with Nicole in ninety four. And then the kids I met through Nicole, and the kids adored me. I adored the kids. So that's how it all started. Hey everybody. 
Our three-part special on the OJ Saga is brought to you by our very good friends at American Hartford Gold. While we like the shocking world of celebrity scandal, don't let financial scandals threaten your retirement funds. We're all feeling the bite of soaring inflation. But our financial future is endangered by a host of other problems, like failing banks, astronomical national debt, and a looming recession. It almost feels criminal, but fortunately, there is a way to protect your hard-earned retirement savings, physical gold and silver. And when it comes to diversifying your savings and tangible assets, I trust American Hartford Gold, and you should too. Whether you want physical gold and silver delivered right to your door, or prefer a tax-advantaged gold IRA, they've got you covered. Their customer service is top-notch. It's amazing, guiding you every single step of the way. And here's the best part. When you mention my name, Tom, you'll receive up to $15,000 worth of free silver on qualifying purchases. Gold has been hitting record highs and shows no signs of stopping, making now the perfect time to secure your nest egg. So don't wait. Call 866-718-8939 or text TOM, T-O-M, to 998899 for your free gold information kit today. Again, that's 866-718-8939 or simply text TOM to 998899. Protect your savings with American Hartford Gold. And um, it's funny, in hindsight, I didn't know this till years, years later, that he had a private detective finding out who this Cato guy was. And I checked out, I must have checked all the boxes. He found out there's no romance with me, Nicole, and he found out that the kids really loved uh, Cato, which made them buy a dog, the Akita, and named it Cato. So that was out of affection. But I never saw uh, any violence, but I did uh, the 911 call, I did help uh, Nicole hammer a, the French door shut. I wasn't there when the incident happened, so people know I wasn't there. But when I when I came there, the police were just leaving, and uh, that was the incident, and that was a uh, part of the trial because that's on tape as a nine one one call. Right. And um, uh, and Tom, you know me from uh, 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 Wisconsin, and I I always talk about my mom and dad about their their love for each other and anytime they got an argument which is seldom they always ended it with a kiss so if i ever saw oj nicole argue i would say the exact same thing and reiterate what my parents would do and i said it works she just love each other that was it and that's the truth yeah and that's the charm of cato by the way if you're new to our show go back and watch some of the past episodes because of course chris jenner now at the time was very good friends with Nicole. And they would drive their kids to school every day together. And, and Cato was always coming home from, he had a job where he worked really late and he'd see Chloe, Kim, you know, in every morning and they, they jump on his bed every morning. So go back and see the backstory no, of that no, because not. that's kind of fascinating too. So, I mean, playful, jump. But not every, not every morning. Okay, not every morning. It happened once or twice. I exaggerated a little yeah. bit. But, but the, the, the bottom line is, you know, the, the backstory, when you think of all the big names that are involved in these and all the iconic A-listers, it's just, it's, it's truly yeah. mind boggling. Okay, um, he doesn't do a lot of interviews and... <laughs> Man, he came across in the trial as the most believable person, just the most humble person that just stuck to the facts. Of course, that's limo driver Alan Park. And Alan, great to see you. And man, your story, because your memory is so good. And then everything you did that night was documented by Pings on Towers, right? Because you were making calls. You were the limo driver. And I think it's, it's really uh, interesting to note that you had just started that job. It's not like you've been doing this for, for several years. So talk about how that night started for you where you ended up picking up O.J. Simpson to take him to LAX. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. And uh, it, uh, it started off with me working for um, the company, which was a neighbor of mine. Uh, he saw me driving another limousine just part-time. And uh, he asked if I wanted to do a little part-time work for him. And knowing that he had a contract with NBC and drove some very well-known people, I was like, yeah, sure, I'd definitely be into that. And so I started to work for him and it had only been about three months uh, uh, since I started with the company. Um, I had driven some other famous and well-known people before that. And I wasn't a very starstruck person. And uh, so that night that I was getting lined up to drive OJ, it was kind of a special night for me. I was looking forward to it because I was a big sports enthusiast, a big NFL fan, and I kind of watched him growing up playing football and, and uh, uh, all the movies and Hertz commercials and all that stuff. So I thought it was, uh, was going to be pretty cool to, to, to drive this guy. Uh, the owner of the company, Dale St. John, 
usually had his um, select few celebrities that he would drive himself, OJ being one of them. And I know that he'd been driving OJ for about seven years. Um, but that night, he could not um, pick him up and take him to the airport. So, um, like I said, it was looking forward to it. And uh, even when I was just getting ready to leave the house, because I hadn't been up in that area up at Brentwood, you know, this is the time before uh, GPS and, and satellite, we were still using an old map book. So I left early and we literally lived like 30 seconds, maybe a minute from the 405 freeway. So I left just a little bit early so I could get up there and uh, just be on time and make sure I found the place. Um, and my boss called me uh, as I was on the on-ramp to the 405 freeway heading to Brentwood. And uh, he just said, where you at? And I said, I'm just getting on the freeway. And he said, okay, I just got home early. I was going to go ahead and, you know, take the run. So I was that close yeah. to not even this happening to me, which I, trust me, I would have been fine with. I'm sure you thought about that a lot, man. Your life would be totally different. I mean, just we're talking about a matter of seconds. Real quickly, OJ had an 1145 flight out of LAX to go to Chicago to play in a Hertz Golf celebrity event in Chicago the next day. Real quickly, what time were you supposed to pick him up? What was the assignment? Uh, the pick up, the actual pickup time was 1045. We're usually there five minutes early. So 1040, I was going to be there. And I actually arrived uh, about 20 minutes early. I was there about 1025. Okay. So again, the timeline, Cato gets back from the McDonald's thing at 936. Alan's supposed to pick up OJ a little bit after that. And then the flight left at 1145. Cato, what did you do after you guys got back? Did you, was that it? You didn't see OJ. He went into the house. Yeah. You went to your bungalow. What did you do next after you got back from yep. Mickey D's? I uh, first thing I did, I, I call up uh, my my friend Tom and my my buddy Tom, uh, who I'm uh, uh, Tom O'Brien. Uh, he was a DA in San Diego, but what, my best friend, we went to high school together, and I just was on the phone, kind of going, "Hey, I just had dinner with OJ Simpson," you know, talking like like the big shot. And uh, then I called up a friend of mine, uh, Rachel, and I was on the phone the whole time, and I'm like, pretty much thankful that all my phone records are right there. And um, so uh, that's where I was. And next thing uh, I I had heard, I mean, I kept thinking, do I hear a buzzer, a buzzer, a bell, uh, a phone ringing? And I believe, Alan, that's you, that you're yeah. ringing the intercom over and over and over and over. And I had no idea. And I'm thinking, is there, what's sure. that noise? Is someone not answering? And then at some point I come out and um, I said to, oh, I was on the phone and I mentioned uh, to Rachel if we had an earthquake, because yeah, that yeah. became a big part because the sure. picture, the picture of my wall moved sort of like a picture behind me and it just tilted enough that we must have just had a little earthquake. And then I ran out and I, I saw Alan by a gate. And I think, Alan, the first thing I said hi to you, I said, hey, did we have an earthquake? Hey, now listen, uh, we're, we're, hey, yeah. we're going to come back to that because that is such a pivotal thing. And I want to cover it a little bit more. So remember, Cato gets back from McDonald's with OJ at 936. Alan shows up after 10, you know, 1030, that 1045, that time for the 1145 flight. But before that is when the murders occurred, shortly after 10 o'clock. So think about it. Drops Cato off. Cato goes into the bungalow, starts calling his friends, and he's doing his thing. OJ, instead of getting ready to go to the airport, he heads over to Bundy, and that's when the murders happen. And that's where our other guest here and a witness who has a fascinating story enters the story. Jill Shively. Jill, great to see you. You were traveling on San Vicente, I believe, in, in uh, Brentwood. You're not that far from Nicole's place on Bundy. So tell us what you were doing, where you were going, and what happened next. I um, I was when left my home. I was trying to get to Westward Ho Market to get something to eat, and uh, so I'm zooming east up on up uh, San Vicente, going to that market because it was in the Brentwood area there in the little village, and right before the market is um, Bundy. So as I'm approaching Bundy going up San Vicente, I almost hit a, a white Bronco. It had its lights off, so I couldn't even see the car. I couldn't see it coming. I probably would have seen it earlier if it had its lights on. All of a sudden, I'm there's a car right in front of me. Okay, and if you don't know the story, if you haven't heard Jill's story in the past, Jill, a little bit more description about that car coming at you. <laughs> okay, so um, 
as I'm approaching uh, Bundy, a car's heading north up Bundy, lights off, um, almost hits my car. I pull to the right. I remember there was like a school there. And this car, the white Bronco, just misses me and kind of goes up on the center median there, like I think the left front tire. He's blocked. He can't go through Bundy up north any further because there's a, a gray, I remember a gray Nissan in his way. So so for a brief second of time, there's me, the white Bronco, and then the gray Nissan, and it's just frozen in time. And then all of a sudden, this per the guy in, in the Bronco is looking at me like I had done something to him, like I was in his way. And, um, so he, he looked at me, I looked at him. I kind of, I knew what I thought it was a football player. I wasn't sure who it was at first. So then he yells move to get out of the way for the gray Nissan. And then he's, cause he kind of stuck his head out. And, um, I recognized the voice as OJ Simpson at that time. Yeah. So he's yelling at the driver to move. They're going back and forth, trying to get out of each other's way. And I remember the third time he backed up, he was able to take off north on, on Bundy. And at that time, I remember catching his license plate number, uh, 3CWZ788. I remember that number. I was going to, I thought he was a drunk driver yeah. because he had his lights off, almost ran into me. I was a single parent. I was really angry because mm -hmm. then he had kind of an attitude. Like I had done something to him. I almost like, it was my fault. Yeah. Like, you know, so yeah. it really angered me. Yeah. I mean, that just gives you chills when you hear this part of the story. You're, you're driving, yeah. a vehicle comes at you sh uh, minutes, minutes after the murders. It's a white Bronco. It's OJ Simpson. He's fleeing the scene of the crime. He almost takes you out, almost hits you. You think it's a drunk driver and ingrained in your mind forever are those, yeah. is the license plate, those digits that stuck with you forever. And we're going to get back to your story, why you weren't in the trial and all the, uh, the other things that happened after that. But Tom Lang, let me ask you this. What You've covered hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of homicides in L.A., what, what's going through the mind of a murderer when they leave a scene of the crime? Clearly, you know, O.J. had a, a violent past. He was an abuser. This, he's clearly capable of this, but I don't think he spent a lot of time probably planning this murder. So what could possibly be going through his mind as he's fleeing and, and knowing the carnage he caused and the adrenaline situation? Well, what's going through his mind as well as any other killers probably he's just, <clears throat> excuse me, wants to get the hell out of there, obviously. You don't want to be caught with the bodies. <clears throat> and uh, when you talk about timelines, this might be important to bring this in really quick. Uh, we obviously, the timeline in this case is extremely important, and these folks that are here today are, are part of that. But there was one other, a man walking a couple of dogs that he did every night right by Bundy in the alley across the street. And he believes that this was about 1035 when he heard a commotion coming from the Bundy house. Uh, the timeline, again, here is important because for all the obvious reasons. So what we did a couple of months after the murders on a Sunday evening, about 1030, we went out to the Bundy location uh, with a, a black and white police unit. And we went from between the murder scene on Bundy to the Rockingham home. We wanted to see about how long it would take to get from Mud Bundy to Rockingham. As the crow flies, it's just about two miles. But when you're on the streets, uh, going through uh, stop signs and everything else, traffic lights, obviously the, the time will be a little off. So we wanted to do this. We did it three ways. We did it by following all the traffic rules of the road, stopping for stop signs completely, uh, driving through away for green lights, signaling our turns, and we drove just normally from Bundy to Rockingham. Then we did it in a, in a bit of a hurry in an unmarked car, Sim similar to what, what uh, uh, Jill is describing here, Simpson driving a little recklessly, a little quickly, popped a couple of stop signs, and a little more of a hurry to get up there. Then we got into a black and white, did a code three, red lights and siren, from Bundy to Rockingham. During those three trips we made, at no time did it take anywhere near four minutes. Never there, four minutes. 
So there's a lot that happened in a very few minutes here that people don't realize. And all of these folks here fit into that timeline. That's why it was so important that they testify to that timeline. This is the beginning of all this stuff. Yeah. And of course, this goes to, to Jill, importantly, why she wasn't used. But that's, you know, I think you're going to be getting into that a little bit. Yep. Wow. And, and, you know, this is Sunday night in L.A. There's no traffic or very light traffic. So, I mean, you, there's there's no hindrances, you know, when you're getting these, these, these two houses are very close to each other. OK, so now be ready because things are going to get really, really dramatic as you hear what happens next. It's it's truly remarkable. And we have everybody that was here. Um, Alan is starting to come to the property to pick up OJ. But in the meantime, because it only takes a couple minutes, OJ gets back to Rockingham, parks the, the Bronco in front of the gate, not in the driveway. Cato, this is, you know, when you were talking about one of the conversations you had with your, with your friend in the Valley. And, and it's such a key moment, and it's so dramatic, where you heard that bump on the wall that you literally thought was an earthquake. We live in LA, we know what an earthquake is. You feel it, you don't panic unless it's a huge one. Hey, there's an earthquake. But it really triggered to you that something happened there. And tell us what it was. Well, I, it was uh, these three thumps, like a thumping noise that were, you know, somewhat loud. And it was powerful enough to move the picture on a wall. And the picture was obviously, uh, you know, framed and it was uh, on, on hooks. So it, it tilted the picture. And immediately I just thought, OK, that might be a, uh, an earthquake. So um, that kept playing on my mind. And uh, as we find out a little bit later, uh, I don't want to jump the gun on the show, but as we find out later and Tom will get into it, is where behind my, there's no window. It's just a wall. So I couldn't peek into a window. And um, I realized that's where they found the bloody glove because um, I had mentioned the noise to the detectives when they came into my room that morning. Um, and uh, when I kept hearing this ringing, which I mentioned, it was Alan trying to get in to pick up OJ for his uh, trip to LAX. And, uh, that made me go outside and yep. that's when i went outside and and saw alan yep and, and you know and kate i'll just say it for you that 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 earthquake you thought was probably oj jumping over the wall and dropping a glove right i mean that's literally yeah in hindsight it, it could be yep yeah, yeah they, they mentioned that tom they mentioned that possibly an air conditioning unit he could have hit the air conditioning use, unit which would have moved the picture Yep. Okay. Now, Alan, back to you, because, you know, you mentioned that, you know, you, you live right off the 405. You could have easily, if, if the call from your boss had come a couple minutes earlier, you wouldn't be going to pick up OJ, but you were, but it wasn't a routine pickup, right? There was all these delays. You knew his flight was at 1145. You're having, probably thinking at one point, is he actually going to make it? You're desperately trying to reach him, calling him, et cetera. So when you got there, about what time it was and, and when did the action start picking up? Uh, yeah, so I think, I, like I said, I, I arrived at the Rockingham uh, property at 1025. And I don't know if anyone's seen photos of the Rockingham property. He lived on a corner, and it was a corner of Rockingham and Ashford. So when I arrived, I came up the Rockingham Street looking for the addresses along the written on the curb. I see an address there. And as we know later, you know, that uh, that's ended up where the Bronco would have been parked that next morning. But I, when I drove up, I could see the address on the curb and I'm looking right at the front of his house and there is no uh, Bronco sitting in front of his house at that time. I made a right-hand turn onto Ashford, made a uh, U-turn and came up the uh, opposite side of the street on Ashford and parked uh, the limo kind of close to the corner. Um, I smoked cigarettes at the time and I got out of the car and I sat on the, um, the curb of the, uh, the sidewalk there. And as I'm sitting on the curb, I can see directly into his property from the Ashford gate. So I'm looking in there and I'm, I'm, you know, I can see basically right towards his front door. Never at any time did I see any motion, any people walking back to any car. I mean, it was completely, there was, looked like no one was actually home. Mm -hmm. So at that point, I get back in the car. It's getting to be about 1040. I drive back up to, onto the Rockingham Street. I look through the gate again, and I can see there's still no Bronco on the street right there. Um, I can see um, straight up to where his garage is. And I think that uh, just the way that the angle of the the um, 
driveway was that I wasn't going to maneuver the, the limo through there as well as from the Ashford side. So at that point, I backed straight up, went up to the, the gate on the Ashford side, and that's when I started to ring the call box that goes into the house there from obviously is what Cato was, was hearing me trying to call in to get uh, inside the property. Uh, he never answers. I let it ring for quite a bit. Um, and at that point, I paged my boss, got back out of the car, rang the, uh, the intercom again. Um, still no answer. I got back in the car at that point. My mom happened to be staying at my house down there in Torrance. And I uh, um, called her to get my boss's phone number. So I was going in and out of the car several times, making phone calls, which we know now are on um, you know, were, were a big, you know, part of the timeline because they were able to establish that through the phone records. Yep. And, um, so in, 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 uh, I just, since I'm such on a, on a time frame and pickups and drop-offs and all that stuff, I was looking at my watch continuously. So I knew every, at sure. the, you know, every time that I made these phone calls, um, so I, last time I get out, I ring, and no one answers the phone inside the limousine rings, which ends up being my boss, Dale St. John. I pick up the phone and that's when I do say, you know, just, I don't think he's there or anybody's there. And I say, Hey Dale, I don't think it was meant to drive this guy. He doesn't seem like he's here. He's, you know, no one's, no one's answering the phone. And that's when he said, well, is there a light on here? And started to point to things around the house that he may sit in here and whatnot. And I said, there's, it's dark. It doesn't yep. look like there's anybody here. As I'm talking to him, that's when I see the dark figure come from kind of towards the garage area, which is over towards the Rockingham side, which would have came out from behind Cato's uh, uh, bungalows back there. I saw him come through the drive, you know, uh, this dark figure dressed in all black and described him as about six foot, 200 pounds and not running, but moving very, very quickly towards the front door. Yeah. And Cato, we're sitting here on June 12, wow. 2024, exactly 30 years ago to the date is when you met Alan for the first time. By, by the way, you both look great. You should see all the comments from when you've been on the shows before. You guys have an age. You look great. But Cato, th th this next part of the story is so pivotal and so dramatic because it involves part of OJ's luggage. He was going there to play golf, so he had his golf bag. He had a, another bag, but he had a third bag, a duffel bag. You and Alan were both very much in, in involved in the transport or lack of, of this bag. So let's talk about it. You get outside, Alan's there, yeah. ready to pick up OJ. Luckily he didn't bail, you know, he's still there. Uh, yeah. and, and, and tell us about this duffel bag that OJ was taking well, out. And I, I'll tell you, Tom, that uh, Alan, uh, just describing that, I, I honestly, I'm, I'm getting goosebumps because of, of the way you you know present yourself and tell the story. And Alan, uh, a question that I have, and uh, I'll get into that, Tom. Alan, the when he when you saw the figure, what, I think the there was luggage already at the door, correct? Yeah, but I couldn't see it at that point. That was okay. the two I bigger duffel bags, but uh, I couldn't see anything at that point, just other than than yeah. him going in quickly and and. Uh, it, after he right. went in is is then when I saw you basically as that person went in not even you know 10 seconds whatever the time was it was a really really short time is when you came out from behind the house there okay and I came up and, from and, a, uh, the a, 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 by the a Ashford for uh, uh, where I saw you at the gate coming in through correct, the guest correct area and this, that is, way. this is after We're, and I guess we should say on that last call, when I saw the dark figure go in, OJ did pick up at that point. And, and, uh, you know, he sounded in a, you know, like he was in a big hurry and he just said, Hey, hey man, sorry. Uh, I overslept. I just got out of the shower. I'll be down in a minute. Yep. Wow. So there so, was already Alan, the so first Alan, time he picked I, up the phone, he was already rushing. So Cato, talk to and us I about the duffel let... bag, the duffel bag, right? Because he okay. didn't want anybody else touching bag. that. So Right. I helped the luggage and Alan and myself where the golf bags were. And then I saw a duffel bag, uh, s sort of like a college um, um, uh, knapsack. And it was dark blue, uh, I, if I remember. And I was go going over to get it, which was about 15 yards away. And I was the closest to it. So I start walking to it. And within me taking seven steps or so, OJ said, no, 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 I got that. Don't, don't touch. It. I got that. And that was it. And, uh, you, said, you even mentioned, well, yes. let, let me go get that bag over there. Because I remember yeah. that. You were like, well, let, let me go get this bag over there. And that's when he, I mean, really jumped out. 
and yeah, he uh, was made a super point. He protective made a, of it. Yeah. Exactly. He did make a point. Like I, even in my mind, I was going, why, why didn't you want me to touch it? It wasn't just like, oh, I'll get it. It was like, no, no, don't, don't get that bag. So yeah, it was, it was odd. Yeah. So I'm, I, that made you suspicious, right? I mean, that was weird. That was odd behavior. Yeah. At the time, we don't know what's happening at all. It was just like, okay, this, you would never think of yeah. there, in hindsight, but uh, yeah, it was still a unusual the way he said it. Okay. So Alan, he gets in the limo oh, yeah. and then you take it from there because your job is to get him to LAX, 1145 flight. Now this is before 9-11 where you could breeze through security at airports pretty quick. LAX is, a, is light on a Sunday night. So it's definitely possible. There's not going to be that much traffic. So he gets into the car. Is he, I mean, this guy just committed a double homicide within the hour. How was he acting? I know we, we know he's an actor, but he's not that good of an actor. So could you sense mm, anything? Uh... I mean, obviously, you don't think that the guy just, you know, brutally murdered two people. Um, that's not going through your head at all. But when we were on our way to the airport, um, you know, he was sweating. He was hot and repeated that he was hot. He had the window down. I told him where he could find the air conditioner. Um, it was, as we talked about uh, early June, and it was now about 11 o'clock at night, a little after 11. And, um, you know, it wasn't hot. It was pre pretty cool. I, I, I'm wearing a suit. I'm, I wasn't hot. So for him to be so hot and, and sweaty, I thought it was a little bit odd. Um, I can hear him. He had bags inside the limo, and he was going through them. And I can hear him saying, you know, man, I know I forgot something. I forgot something. And as he was rummaging through the bags, he just asked me which way I was going to take to the airport, suggested a way. And that's at that point, um, we were running pretty short on time. So wow. I drove pretty quick, man. I mean, I was, I was hauling and, uh, not traffic was pretty light. And, um, so that was about the extent of there. But when, once we got to the airport, I pull up to the curbside there. I start to help him with bags. He still didn't want me to help him with bags. Um, he was really hesitant on what I was touching, what not, um, Jeez. asked me if I could get him some help and, um, which I tried, I brought him a cart. I even tried to still help at that point, you know, touching stuff to put on the cart. And he still really did not want me to help at all. He was, you know, he was, uh, you know, just kind of still kind of shooing me away. I remember somebody approaching him. I think he might've even signed an autograph. He, um, said, thank you very much. Add 20% to the bill. And, uh, you know, have a good night. I was going through, I usually always go to check the limo just in case that uh, anybody left anything in there. Um, I looked over to where he was checking in curbside with American Airlines. And that's where I saw the bag that Cato um, offered to go get that he was super, super protected of. I saw it sitting on top of a trash can there at American Airlines. I looked, um, he, I did my check of the car and at that point I got into the car to leave. I lost sight of the bag. I don't know what happened to it, but the last thing I see is him running through the, uh, the airport towards the gate. Yep, perfect setup, Alan. I mean, oh, by the way, he tipped you, right? 20%, is that what you said? Added 20% to the tip? Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. I, I don't even know if I ever even got that tip. <laughs> okay, so. And, 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 and running through an airport. <laughs> right? Like commercial. Yeah, it was uh, it was a typical Hertz commercial. It could kind of, yeah. you know, the been any more uh, perfect. It's a melodrama. It's all just uh, too crazy to believe, but it did happen. And it leads us to the next part of the story and our next guest. You see him there with a the St. Jude sweatshirt on. Great supporter of that hospital in Memphis. Uh, donates a lot of money to it. Um, former executive, used to work with People Magazine, Sports Illustrated, big time sales exec for him. So he's used to traveling. He knows the layout of LAX, plus his wife worked for American Airlines. Let me introduce you to Skip Junis here. Skip. Um, you pick up the next part of the story because you were the guy that happened to be right in front of that door at American Airlines picking up your do your wife, I believe Terminal 5 at LAX. When Alan Park pulls up with OJ, you know about this duffel bag. You're there. Why don't you take the story from there? It's interesting listening to this because it, it just adds me to... We're, we're stopping for a second here, Skip, because your signal's not, not working. Okay, here's what we're going to do. Um, I'm just going to have to edit in something from his show. You're, you see him, you're 30, 25 feet, 30 feet away. You know it's O.J. Simpson, and um, you're in your car. 
you, you know from your view it's him. You see him go to a garbage can on the outside, uh, I suppose, where, where baggage is. Uh, a, a porter might be out there. Is that in your mind, do you even think anything? Why is he throwing stuff out? Or are you just saying, okay, he's throwing garbage out of this bag? Well, at the scene where the, where the limo and where I were parked, right there is the, uh, uh, the uh, podium for the sky caps. Yeah. So when I first saw him get out of the limo, uh, you know, they were unloading his Louis Vuitton luggage out of the out of the trunk. But he was carrying uh, the best way I can describe it is a cheap gym bag. And I recognize that kind of bag because I used to have one when I was an athlete carrying shoes and clothes and stuff like that to a game or something. Sure. And um, uh, I watched him walk over. Uh, he wouldn't let the sky cap or the. Uh, uh, limo driver touched the bag. They both offered and he said, no, I've got it. He held on to it. And while they were messing with the luggage, he went over to the trash can, which is a tall trash can with a lid on it, with a hole where you stuff tr trash right. into it. And he put this bag on top of the uh, trash can. And then what was really peculiar is that he didn't unzip it all the way. He only zipped it just part way at the bottom, just enough to get his hand inside and pull stuff out and then immediately put it in the trash can. And, and, and he was, he had positioned himself. So he was between the sky cap and the limo driver and the trash can. So they really couldn't see what he was doing. I was at a, at a, a, a more of a, a advantageous angle to watch with this. And, uh, you know, it wasn't like I was watching every movie made, but watching this had caught my eye because it was very, very peculiar behavior. <laughs> I mean, that that is a powerful, powerful testimony from an eyewitness who was right there, who knows the layout of LAX. His, his wife was a star employee there. Skip's wife had worked at American Airlines for years. Everybody knew them. And for, and for someone that travels as much as Skip does, for something to stand out like that, that's something that's indelible in your mind forever. And wow, that was just an amazing story. And Cato, it just, you know, it just makes sense. Like when you think about OJ, you know, he wasn't making a lot of smart decisions, but you hear theories that he dumped the knife in some bushes near the house. I don't buy that. Someone would eventually find it. I think right. the only place you could put it was probably in a trash can at LAX where there's not many cameras well, and they don't grab the garbage to, and send it to the same landfill. So opening it up like that, does that make sense to you? You know, it just blows me away that that uh, the way Skip, and by the way, Skip is so credible, the way it goes halfway in there. And you know what? There's many garbage cans. I think possibly one item in one garbage can, another item in another garbage can, and it went all over the airport. Uh, it, it just... Like I said, Tom, that that duffel bag is just always blowing my mind. It's never been found, so it makes complete sense of what Skip just said. Yep, and, and Skip's such a credible witness, and and you would think, why wasn't he in the trial and whatnot? But you know, obviously, right. Tom, we go to you, Tom Lang. Um, you know that that's a lead, that's a clue, that's something that would get your attention quickly. When when did you find out the story of what Skip saw at the airport, Tom? And and what could you do about it, really? Because we're talking huge landfills throughout LA, not knowing when it gets dumped, whether there's cameras there. What did you do with that information? Okay, uh, on March 29 of '95, we were well into the trial, and I was back in the office on a break. And the phone rang, and it was Skip. Skip had introduced himself on the phone and told me who he was. And he had mentioned that your story, that he was at the airport picking his wife up at a little, a little after 11 p.m., night of the murders, and the whole story about the limo driving up <clears throat> and Simpson getting out, him recognizing Simpson. And looking back around, his attention diverted slightly towards the front, to see his wife if she was coming out. I believe she was running a little bit late, so he was concerned, so he's looking there, and he looks back, and he sees Simpson standing next to one of two trash containers located on either side of the entranceway. The containers, uh, I believe, were like 44 inches in height, square, four sides open with a flat top, and he saw this 
aforementioned travel bag, described that described as a half moon shaped travel bag on top of the crash container to his left. And Simpson appeared to have his arm, his hand in the bag and removed some, some item, unidentifiable, unidentifiable item out of the, out of the trash, uh, out of the uh, half moon shaped travel bag and into the trash container. Uh, after this, he saw him zip up the container, pick it up, and move on inside. His wife came out, and they and they drove on. <clears throat> now, obviously, at this point, the bodies had not been discovered. And the next day, when the when the story broke, the media was all over it, and they had mentioned uh, that uh, O.J. Simpson could be a possible suspect, something to that effect. And uh, they also had mentioned an inaccurate time that regarding uh, Nicole's mother, Judith, had called about the glasses. She had told the media something about the glasses and they got the times mixed up somehow uh, later on and they had the wrong time. So Skip listened to this testimony in court. Again, this is Six, uh, seven, nine months later, he's listening to this testimony in court, and he says, you know, I saw Simpson there, of course, and, and he couldn't have been involved, at least I thought, so I called in right away the following day from the murders when I heard about this, but I called into the defense, and I thought that, you know, I might help out Simpson or be a defense witness or something, because he couldn't have done it because the reports from the media say that he probably would have been at LAX at the time that these murders had occurred. That was his belief. So he's telling this to one of the defense investigators who says, thank you very much, we'll get right back to you. Well, the defense investigators certainly don't want to hear this, and we never heard another word about it. But after he gave me the information, I asked him where he was in relation to LAX. And he says, well, I'm fairly close by. And I said, could you meet us there now? I'd like to meet you there and, and do a walkthrough and uh, I'll bring a, the a criminalist with me and a photographer. We'd like to do a little informal interview initially at the location. So he says, fine. And he went out and met us at the airport he told us that he had driven up in a in his car and uh, was waiting for his wife in the aforementioned story the whole whole nine yards. And he showed us the containers. Well, of course, back then there were no security cameras. Uh, we checked into the uh, garbage pickup, thinking all along that this bag has never been seen since. We, of course, had Cato's statement about a bag. Uh, we were wondering. Uh, whatever happened to this bag that no one has ever seen. We're well into the, the trial. What could he have been putting into the trash container? It was obviously of interest. So I took this back. Uh, we, we photographed everything. We found out that there were three pickups daily, basic pickups at the time of trash containers at LAX, and they all went to two common landfills in the area. What, what are the chances eight, nine months later of finding something like that to, that was dumped into one of two landfills, we didn't know which one, of finding anything, well, they were zero and zero. Anyway, I took this information uh, back to Marcia, and I was kind of excited because all along people were wondering, well, where are the shoes, where's the bloody clothing, where's the knife, and all this other stuff. So I took it back to Marcia, and I explained the situation. And I was, I was really floored, and I would get floored really easy. She just looked at me and said, well, you know, it's a one-on-one -on -one situation, and we, we cannot co we can't cooperate it. I was thinking, this is a very reliable witness. Uh, he went to the defense first, and he's been watching the trial, and now he's his statement to me. I mean, this is really good stuff, highly circumstantial. But if I'm in the jury, I want to hear this. I want to hear all about this. So uh, she says, no, it's just we, we can't cooperate it. And this, uh, she's really negative on it without even asking any further questions or anything off. That really pissed me off. You never saw this thing in trial. Years later, I'm doing a special uh, with Alan, 
and we're going over this thing. And he tells me that, yeah, as he pulled away, he too saw the bag, this half moon trade sh uh, shaped travel bag on top of this trash container. He says, yeah, I saw it as I drove away and Simpson was standing next to the container. Well, I'm thinking back at the time, 26 years when I'm talking to Marcia, and she tells me that we couldn't corroborate it. Well, it was wow. corroborated by Alan. And I, I testified said, oh, to you it. tell us the Marcia? He says, yeah, I told her all about it <laughs> when I was interviewed before I testified. So we had corroboration all along. Uh, so I say why Marcia would misstate. I hate to use the word lying because too many people use it too frequently. But why would she lie about something like that? We have that, May. We had Skip corroborated yeah. by Alan and vice versa. This is good stuff. And this was never, ever brought up at trial. Yeah. Yeah, Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Incredible people. Yeah, I saw Jill shaking her head. We're going to get back to Jill in a second. She's shaking her head when you hear Marsha not wanting to use it. Skip never testified because Marsha didn't want him to. Tom, real quickly, quick question. If somehow you had found out that that night or that something was dumped at the trash can at LAX, like if you got that information the next day, could you have found that whatever he was dumping? Do you think you would have got to the landfill? And if you found the knife, would we have a total different result? Well, obviously, let me throw it real quick again. That bag was never found. But if we'd have found it the next day, uh, I would have impounded that trash container. Uh, we would have searched it thoroughly, obviously. If there was anything in it, I would have also had it processed for prints. It may have had his prints on it. If it had his prints on it, that would have corroborated the story further. Uh, we would have checked in a little closer by as the two landfills go. Which garbage can do it? Truck actually made the pickup if there was nothing in it when I when I first found it. If we really, we might have gotten lucky. I, I don't know. Yeah, sure. This was a uh, Sunday night and uh, early Monday morning. If they hadn't picked up the trash, it may have still been in there Monday morning. We will never know. Yeah, you had that information. Who knows? It could have been a plea deal. You know, he may have said, "Yeah, you got me." Whatever. Cato, could you? I mean, we're doing this on June 12, twenty four. These events we're talking about on the show happened exactly 30 years ago today. Cato, imagine if this happened now. I mean, he there would be so many ways to prove it was him from lights, camera, security, uh, cameras yeah. at LAX, DNA, or well, you know, not so much DNA because they blew it back then. But just think about it. Everything would have been documented. He would have seen his whole drive back where he almost hit Jill. Yeah, I know. Exactly. It's uh, Because 30 years ago, and obviously we're film, uh, filming this today, and it's 30 years ago today, that it'd be totally different with security of how security works now with airports after 911 happened. And it would have been probably a slam dunk to see everything going on with cameras can actually pinpoint everything in a you know hand in a bag. OK, so, Jill, I saw you <laughs> kind of shaking your head a little bit when when uh, Detective Lang was talking about his interactions with Marsha Clark about Skip's evidence. You've got a similar story. You had some run ins with her. Uh, if you watch some of the document or the movies that were made about this, we've seen it. It's uh, it's been portrayed several times. You lived it. You got the information. Almost OJ almost ran you over on San Vicente after leaving the scene of the crime. You get the license plate. What do you do with the information? And I think a lot of people are wondering why didn't we see you as a witness in the trial? Well, um, I. Uh... I, 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 I sold my start story to hard copy. They came to my door and I really didn't understand what was happening at the time. Um, being bombarded by media, all of a sudden everybody had my information, knew where I lived. So anyway, I get some producers coming to my door. They tell me, Hey, you know, all the other witnesses are talking about the case. And they brought up the uh, Jose Camacho and they brought up uh, other, other witnesses. I think there was, um, I think it there was they I think they even mentioned Del St. John, but they said to me, Hey, uh, I asked them, Do you have clearance with the DA's office? Yeah, I mentioned Patty. I remember mentioning Patty Joe Fairbanks because I had her card with her number on it. I said, Do we need to call her? I said, No, 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 we we've got it cleared. So then they rushed me down to the studio and and we do this interview. And um, they said, Hey, you know, we'll offer you five thousand dollars. I said, okay, if, if that's okay. So at some point, Marsha Clark 
hears about it and she calls me to her office. And I remember being scared. I thought I was being arrested or something. It was really frightening me. But she basically gets on my face and tells me that I blew her case. And I said, well, you know, I haven't taken any money. I, you know, I haven't taken, at that point, I hadn't taken any money. And uh, she says, well, no, I don't need you. I have enough circumstantial evidence. And uh, so she just she kept yelling at me and yelling at me for blowing her case. And then, no, but they'll be fine. I, I have enough circumstantial. Yeah. So I said, okay, I apologize. I tried to redeem myself. And nothing would have been I turned down so many other interviews with tons of other money. And uh, I remember having to hire an attorney to stop her from harassing me. She would call oh me down goodness. to the office two or three times. So I did take the $5,000 and I gave it to that attorney. And then he was friends with uh, Phil Van Adder. They actually played football together in high school. And uh, so then he actually, and then David, David Kahn, I think, stood up for me. But it was just nerve wracking with Marsha because I felt, I felt like I was the criminal at that point, And I felt like I thought I was going to be arrested. Jill, that's, your story's unbelievable. The, the jury should have heard it. The world should have heard it. It's powerful. It's compelling. Uh, the fact that Marsha didn't think that you would be a good witness for a $5,000 interview, please give me a break. Ridiculous. That shows some of the fear that she was operating under. Someone should have been over her to tell her, no, Jill would be a great witness. Alan, you had multiple interactions, of course, because you were a star witness in the trial. So you dealt with Marsha a ton. She could be demanding, you know? Uh, including one time where you were subpoenaed to appear at the preliminary hearing, but you were already on Catalina Island. I think this is a fascinating story that you shared with me in private once before, but tell us the circumstances there and how demanding she was and how you got back there. Well, I mean, it uh, it started when I was supposed to be on the preliminary, or when I was taking the stand in the preliminary hearing, which took place on a Friday, um, which I was getting ready to go on the stand, waiting for her um, to call me down as the, as a, as a witness. And um, she started taking longer and longer and longer, which um, I was waiting up in her room uh, to go on the stand. And um, I come to find out that um, the uh, defense had a tape recording of me and uh, she came up to the, uh, uh, up to her office to come grab me. And she let me know that there was this tape recording of me and asked if I talked to the defense. And I said, no, I never talked to the defense. At that point, I didn't remember. And then she said, are you sure they have this uh, recording of you? And I said, it made me think. I was like, yeah, you know, and honestly, I, I think I do. I, I do remember them, which they were the very first people to ever call me. Oh, the LAPD, uh, anybody, the defense called me first. Murders happened on a Sunday. They called me on a Tuesday and uh, recorded my phone conversation, never told me they were recording it. Um, so she wanted to listen to the tape before she put me on the stand, which we did. We listened to the tape. Um, everything was consistent with uh, the rest of my testimony. And uh, she wanted to go over it and didn't uh, want to put me on the stand that day. So she was going to move my testimony until Monday. And uh, so she said, just take the weekend off. I'll see you here Monday. And uh, I just said, that, that's fine. But um, I said, I kind of have a problem with that. I said, Sunday is the 4th of July and I always light off the firework show on Catalina Island. And uh, she said, well, that's okay. Just go do, you know, go have fun with your family and, and do what you want to do. And just, I need you here Monday morning. I said, well, I don't have any reservation to get off that Island Monday morning. I said, I guarantee you, I will not be able to get one. And she said, well, just go try and uh, just let me know. I said, all right, I'm just guaranteeing you right now. So I went back to the Island tried to get the reservations, nothing on the boats, nothing on the helicopters. Uh, and uh, so I called her back to let her know that there's no way I'm getting off this island. She said, well, I need you here Monday morning because you are on my witness list. You have to be here. I said, okay, but I'm just letting you know, I can go standby. And she said, what's that? And I said, well, I can go down there. If someone doesn't show up, I get their ticket. And she said, no, no, I can't have that. You, you need to be here. So let me give you a call back. So a couple hours goes by and she calls you back and says, you and your mom be down at the heliport six o'clock in the morning and uh, we're going to get you here. So to come to find out, she had the LA County Sheriff's helicopter come pick me up on Catalina and uh, take me back to the mainland. And uh, I thought they were just going to land in, 
in Santa Monica or Torrance and then drive us the rest of the way, but they didn't. I mean, they had a parking lot cleared out in downtown LA. We were flying through the skyscrapers. It was just, it was unbelievable. I mean, I just couldn't believe the lengths they were going to to get me to this trial. Wow. It just seemed at the point, it was just insane. Right. That's unreal. So helicopters That's... zipping through skyscrapers, right? To get you down there? Right. Very right. dramatic. You know, I just, yeah. It, it's something you'll never forget. Hey, Tom Lang. Yeah, I, it, 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 it reiterates, Tom, also how important Alan is if they're going to get a helicopter that they really need Alan's testimony. Yeah, because she didn't hesitate. She said, no, we'll have the helicopter waiting for you. And they got yeah. you down there. You know, I'm not sure if everybody else on the panel knows this next thing that I'm going to ask Alan. And I know everybody watching this probably doesn't. But Alan, you alluded to that phone call with the defense a couple days after the murders that they contacted you first. And it was Robert Shapiro on that call and somebody else. And then they taped it. And, and mention again what happened at the end of that call that, Mar that w w you were on with Marsha listening to the tape recording. Yeah, so we sat down and listened to the tape recording um, of the two attorneys, which was Robert Shapiro. The other one was Leroy Taft, Skip Taft. And uh, we went through all their questioning and which, you know, everything was consistent with the rest of my testimony. Go through the whole tape recording. They say, thank you for your time. Uh, we'll be in touch with you if we have any more questions. They hang up the phone or I hang up the phone and, uh, but they leave the tape recording going, the tape that we're actually listening to in Marsha Clark's office. Wow. And we can hear them say, you know, um, they say, that's funny. That's not what OJ's telling us. And I mean, I just looked at Marsha and my mom. I mean, our jaws dropped. I couldn't believe what they were saying. And then one of the other ones say, are you usually sweaty when you get out of the shower? And then that's when they actually, you know, hung up. I, I, I don't know if it was done on purpose. I mean, why would they leave that on there? Did they listen to the whole right. tape and even know it was there? It was just, it, it was baffling to me. Yeah. Hey, wow. Cato, Cato, if that, if that tells you anything, I mean, if there's anything about, you know, you and Alan, you know, became big stars from the trial, clearly. But if there's anything that anybody drew a conclusion about Alan is that he's telling the truth. Right? He, his memory is so good. When he was on the stand, everything was so detailed and he was telling the truth. So if he described a situation and then Robert Shapiro's talking to OJ on this thing and he's saying, that's not what you told him, that's not what you said, or that's not the story that you had, who do you think's lying? <laughs> right? I mean, that just yeah, clearly no, tells exactly. you that OJ and, switching um, up his stories. Yeah, Alan, Alan is just so uh, dependable and Alan is so, so credible. And Alan was, uh, you know, trained with a, a limo driver of having a timeline. He looks at his watch. He's got to be on time. He's picking up a celebrity. So everything that Alan says is credible. And we've been saying Marsha, Marsha the whole time during this interview. I want people that aren't even familiar with the OJ trial. This is Marsha Clark, not Marsha Brady, just so everybody knows. <laughs> By the way, Cato, I bet you've done a couple shows with Marsha Brady, or at least a couple auditions or something along the way, right? You know everybody in Hollywood. Wait, I, saw, I, I met quite a few of the Bradys. <laughs> Shocking. Uh, they're real characters, though. I mean, yeah. the real people I actually have. Yeah, yeah. okay. Well, back to the Sorry, topic like... of whether OJ's telling the truth or not in flopping stories. The man who was in the middle of the biggest episode of that is Detective Tom Lang, and, and, it, and it involves when OJ came back from Chicago and the cuts on his finger. And this thing took on a life of its own. And, and, and Tom, I know it's something that happened 30 years ago, almost to the day, but just, just take us back to what you were thinking when you're asking a simple question, what happened to your finger? The cut on your finger that was bleeding. And he gives you this wishy-washy, hog posh, you know, roundabout answer. Just a seasoned guy like you who's seen it all and heard it all. What were you thinking? Real quick, I just want to say that is what Alan was talking about a conversation uh it's a violation of 635 of the california penal code it could be prosecuted as either a misdemeanor or a felony them not telling uh, alan that they were discussing anything over the phone he was never informed they were in violation of the law by doing that this right. died uh, they, they, at, at uh, sidebar believe it or not this thing was brought up and they just forgot about it anyway getting back uh, I did. I did sue him, Tom. Oh, I hope you won. I did. I did. Right. I took him to small claims court, and he had to go down there like every other guy in the, in the world. And, and good, I didn't and know I, that. Good for you. No, I, I did. I won the judgment. You just made yeah, my day. Congrats. Yeah. Congrats. Thank you. 
anyway, we've got Simpson. Uh, we are interviewing him, and he's obviously the the type of individual who has to has to run the conversation, or you're not going to have a conversation. Such was the same with his two attorneys, Skip Taff and Howard Weissman, I believe was the other one at the time initially. And he'd have a little talk with them. They'd ask if they could talk to, as they said, his their client at the time separately before we talked to him. I said, fine, obviously. So they went in and they spoke for a few moments. Then they came out and they said, yeah, OJ, I'll talk to you. And uh, uh, Weissman said this. And uh, Skip and I are going to lunch and we'll be back in a little, little while. So they said, okay. So they took off, and Simpson is in there. There's no doubt in my mind that uh, he's the type of individual who believes he's in charge. He's very narcissistic in that regard. When you have a person like that who you suspect is a possible suspect, if you hard-ass him, if you turn this into some kind of an interrogation, if you slam your fist down and yell at him, he's just going to invoke. He said, hey, I'm here to try to help you guys, and you're yelling at me. I don't to talk to you. He's out the door. You never do that. Some people at the time were so ignorant to actually say this should have turned in some kind of an interrogation and you nail this guy. It's not going to work with someone like an O.J. Simpson who's beyond a narcissist. He's a sociopath. You don't ever attack somebody under those circumstances. What you do is you let them talk. And that's exactly what we did. Later on, this became an issue and I wrote I've written this up so many times. It's in my book, uh, Evidence Dismissed. There were like 11 or 12 different areas that were inquisitory and accusatory statements that he gave us throughout this so called interrogation, some called it. It's not, it was an interview that should have been used and never were in trial. You talk about his bloody finger, the left hand, ring finger on the left hand. We've got at the crime scene, we've got suspect probably is bleeding on the left side of their body unless they were walking backwards in, co in collaboration with the footwear impressions, which were moving away from the bodies. And out to the left, of course, we had this blood trail. There were five or six blood drops tailing in the same direction that the footwear impressions were going towards the rear gate. This blood is O.J. Simpson's blood. So obviously, we didn't know that at the time, but we have this man with a bleeding finger, so we're gonna ask him about the bleeding finger. And in a 30th minute interview, we get three different interpretations, and finally, he doesn't know how he did it. I ask him, did you ever bleed at the, at the location? But yeah, probably, you know, the might have bled there. I bleed all the time. So we're going to get the runaround and everything else. He could never tell you. If I cut my fingers, and I've cut myself a lot of times because I spent a lot of time working on my hill back here, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put a Band-Aid around it. It usually takes care of it. But I'm not going to know when I cut milk because you get blood all over you, and I don't think anybody wants to bleed all over them. You're going to do something to stop the bleeding. This goes deep enough that while we're speaking to him, he's still bleeding. So we're going to want to know about that. One of the, the statements we get is uh, he, he, he bled it. He bled when uh, he was told over the phone in a Chicago hotel room about Nicole getting killed. He said, I was so upset I smashed a glass into the sink. Back then, today, of course, they, they don't have a lot of glass drinking, uh, drinking glasses in, in hotel rooms. They're usually hard plastic or something like that because they do break. We went back to that hotel room that they secured for us. Nothing was changed. The, the linen was still there. The broken glass and the glass that he broke where he cut his finger was still there. It was in the sink. Everything was as it was. So I went back there, and I picked up one of these glasses. Well, back then, obviously, the hotel management didn't want a patron cutting himself on a broken glass. So the glasses were very, very thick. So what I did, I picked up one of the glasses and went down to the down to the uh, counter at the end of the counter and I flung it about six feet down the counter and it hit the glass and it rolled around and it, and it didn't break. So I picked it up and I, I dropped it in the sink and it still didn't break. So how did he break this and how was his blood on this broken glass? Well, in my mind, he probably did it on purpose because right after it happened, he 
went down and he explained to the desk person downstairs that he cut his hand and he would like a band-aid if he could for his hand. So that was his little alibi that he came, came upon back there in Chicago. So I took those glasses and I brought them back, back with me and I booked them as evidence to show that that kind of an alibi probably wouldn't fly. And you can do all the tests you want about dropping these glasses, but as thick as that glass was, it just didn't break into the amount of glass it broke there. That glass was broken on purpose. This was part of his wow. alibi. You never saw that in trial, like so many other things. Wow. I've got five typewritten pages, five pages here of typewritten things that should have been brought in trial that were all in or as far as his guilt, you never saw. Hey, everybody. Our three-part special on the OJ saga is brought to you by our very good friends at American Hartford Gold. While we like the shocking world of celebrity scandal, don't let financial scandals threaten your retirement funds. We're all feeling the bite of soaring inflation. But our financial future is endangered by a host of other problems, like failing banks, astronomical national debt, and a looming recession. It almost feels criminal, but fortunately, there is a way to protect your hard-earned retirement savings, physical gold and silver. And when it comes to diversifying your savings and tangible assets, I trust American Hartford Gold, and you should too. Whether you want physical gold and silver delivered right to your door or prefer a tax-advantaged gold IRA, they've got you covered. Their customer service is top-notch. It's amazing, guiding you every single step of the way. And here's the best part. When you mention my name, Tom, you'll receive up to $15,000 worth of free silver on qualifying purchases. Gold Gold has been hitting record highs and shows no signs of stopping, making now the perfect time to secure your nest egg. So call 866-718-8939 or text TOM, T-O-M, to 998899 for your free gold information kit today. Again, that's 866-718-8939 or simply text TOM to 998899. Protect your savings with American Hartford Gold. Huh. That's, That's amazing. Cool. It's amazing. Uh, you, know, you know, I mentioned off the top of the show, this has never been done before, where we've had these key figures from the OJ saga together. And we can do this for three, four, five hours easy, but I want to give you, Cato, the chance just to have a conversation with Alan, Jill, and, and Detective Lang here. And just you guys maybe ask yourself some questions that maybe you've never had to do before. You know, take a few minutes, maybe well, not, not super long answers, yeah. but just take a little time well, here to have this convo. Well, you know, you said this has never been done before and all that. I'll tell you something else that's never been done before. Alan Park is the only one that actually beat the Dream Team by winning his case. <laughs> Good so job. That's, that, that's <laughs> true. <laughs> but um, I, I think, uh, Alan, when you have done the show before, people, uh, we, by the way, we get thousands of comments, and I'm saying 98% incredibly positive, and that goes for Jill and Tom. And it, it's just been incredible. And, Alan, uh, we talked about this before, how in, how – bizarre was that when we were outside and I, we, we I, I don't want to get into the whole thing again because we have a you know time no. limit but how weird it was when um uh with a flashlight going back oj said let's check it and then turned around and um yeah I, I, that plays well, in my mind I, since I, talking I, about that and thank god that you were there i'm just saying just in case something bizarre would have happened right i mean it uh it just already started off odd when you were concerned about the earthquake and you kept going over to the garage with that little light that you had and you wanted to go back there and look for something and you kept asking me if i if we you know had an earthquake or if i felt an earthquake and it just it, it was right then it was so it, it just kept coming out to me as is weird i'm like hey, what is this guy doing he kept wanting to go back there and search but you just didn't want to do it and uh right and when it came to the end there and when oj said you know, uh, he, you finally got him concerned enough, I guess, to, to seem like, uh, you know, he wanted to go back there and look for something. And, and when I heard him say, you go around that way, I go around that way, you know, pointing the other direction, I can clearly see him do that. And uh, you started to go around the garage and he followed right behind you. And I just right, it's just so bizarre. I was like, I just heard him say he was going to go the other way. Yeah, and, it's, uh, it's bizarre. And he, and thank God you were there actually, and you were actually going to be part of following. So that kind of like, he said, no, I, then everything just turned into, let's go to the airport. 
Um, but yeah, yeah, that played in my mind what you being on the show and you, if you ever go back to that, you can see some of the questions. I won't talk anymore. I'll let, uh, uh, you guys, but, uh, great seeing Jill because uh, your story is just, it, it still blows me away that you saw coming back from the crime scene and then Tom verifying it and finding out how credible you are and then introducing us to get information from you to do our show. And Tom just been like myself from Wisconsin, Milwaukee, and obviously uh, I, I consider Tom a 30 year old friend now, and this being June 12th. Yeah, that's hey, right. Hey, hey, Tom Lang, let me ask you this question. And, and Cato, I apologize in advance for doing this, but Tom, when you showed up at Cato's bungalow that morning and you see Cato, he had longer hair back then, right? He had a vibe, cool dude, you know, you think he's a surfer, even though he came from Milwaukee. He has a headless mannequin in his car that you may not have known about named Dolores, which he used to transport himself through the uh, express lanes on the 405 to beat traffic. What, Carpool. Were, were, you Carpool. A little, were you a little suspicious of Cato Kalin when you first met him? Or did he come across as the lovable, innocent, wonderful guy that we all know him to be? Well, Cato is Cato. And by the way, Cato, we did find his car out on Ashford, and we did look at it. <laughs> we did, we, did uh, we were aware of the mannequin story later on. Uh, but Cato was uh, one of the characters, if you want to call the character of the case, that came off as real. Uh, it wasn't a put up. It wasn't, uh, he wasn't being a smart ass like I think Marcia thought he was. He was being Cato. And everything Cato has said over the years has been straight on. And uh, Cato, I also consider you a friend after 30 years. You've been through I appreciate it. And I respect you for what you have done. Uh, people are playing games with you and having it with you, and it's all BS because you are a good man. You are straight. You've been honest throughout this entire affair, and uh, I'm proud to know you. My, you know, thank you, Tom. That really means a lot to me, and I really appreciate those words. Yeah. And it, uh, like I said, means a lot. Thank you. You know, we, we, I have individual, Cato and I have uh, individual episodes with everybody you see here. So go back in our content. You can get more and more and more of these stories. A couple just final questions here that I have. You know, you guys, your lives changed, obviously, never the same after June 12, 30 years ago today. What kind of offers were thrown at you at the time? Because the, the media was so desperate to get morsels and stories. Give us some of the strange stories about what you were being offered to talk back then. I have one really weird. Um, I don't know who, um, when, one day I'm at home and my daughter with my daughter and these two guys show up at my door and they, they said they were sent by Skip. So I, and I think one of the guys was Skip, but it wasn't Skip, uh, the, the Skip, it was not Skip Taft because I looked him up. But they offered me 40000 to go away on vacation. And I was like, um, no. And then they got really persistent and really aggressive about it. And I remember I said, I, I got to go. And they went around to my back door. And we're looking in my back door and my windows. It was just like, oh, my gosh. I, I didn't. I, at that moment, it, I just didn't feel safe anymore. I felt like a fish in a fishbowl. And, and then, you know, obviously, you always get out. They were calling you, offering all kinds of money. And so I was trying to stay trying to redeem my credibility. So I was saying, no, no, no. But these two guys who showed up at my door were very aggressive and like, it was almost like the Godfather. We're gonna make you an offer you can't refuse. And I'm like, right. like no. <laughs> so I remember shutting my door and they were, I looked out and they were just still standing there and they were, were sent by Skip. Yeah. So oh. it was weird. Alan, were you ever That's tempted bizarre. to take some offers? Alan, I'm sure the, the offers for you were just flying everywhere. How big were they? In, in yeah, a, I mean, uh, I, yeah, I mean, there was some offers in the beginning, you know, upwards of over a hundred grand or more uh, yeah. from Current Affair and some other um, uh, uh, tabloid magazines and stuff like that. Um, I kind of shied away from everything, you know. I, um, I didn't care to do any of it. It uh, just profiting off of two people's deaths to me was just it just wasn't right. It didn't sit right with me. So. Um, you know, there were some big offers. I it, Not to say that I didn't do some things here or there, but it was more for, um, I guess, like for the fun of it. You know, I played in some celebrity golf tournaments and played in some celebrity softball tournaments. And, you know, a lot of it was for a good cause or whatnot. And just kind of had a little bit of fun with it that way. Um, 
you, you know, and just, uh, it, there was some bizarre offers um, from some people, you know, want me to drive them across the US or whatever. I still today get mail um, wanting me to sign autographs or sign pictures and stuff like that. So that's still, still kind of mm -hmm. odd. Yeah. Um, I try not to let it affect me um, as in change my life. I think right. I did pretty well with that. Uh, but you couldn't help from it changing or affecting your life. That's for sure. Yeah, for sure. Tom, Tom, are you at all surprised at the public fascination to this day, 30 years later, with the whole saga? Because there's so many moving parts. There's so many characters. There's so many different side angles. Are you kind of throw, blown away that the, the fascination with the story is still so intense 30 years later? Uh Yes and no. I, I think there, you know, back when, when this, this went down, this was before a lot of uh, 24 hour news stations. This is before Fox and CNN had just been getting out of the way. And there wasn't the competition that there is today. I mean, every year goes by, I hear something, someone with a new angle on this case. Uh, it, it, everything came, there's no, there's no questions in this case as far as I'm concerned. There are no unanswered questions. There are a few things that people don't understand that occurred. <clears throat> but when everything came out, that's why I wrote the book, because I didn't want to write a book at first. I was talked into it by an agent, and I'm glad he talked me into it. Because things change over the years. A lot of people writing about this case today weren't even born back then. What we did, I've got books here that I've documented everything from day one. I've always been the type that documents all my cases for my own personal reasons, because sometimes later people will come back and say, well, what about this, what about that? I've got everything written down. I know exactly what happened. Wow. That's important to document. Even your, your lives, people who are not in the, in the, in the public sector out there, whatever, Write stuff down. I tell this to my grandson all the time and my kids. Write things down because it may come back to bite you in the fanny and you want to come back with a response. That's very true today. Yep. A lot of the stuff you hear today just didn't happen. Oh. And it's everybody needs a project. We've got to be entertained. People, people want to be entertained. They not necessarily care about facts. They want frivolity. They want to be entertained, unfortunately. Yep. Cato, I'm going to leave the last word for you here. Um, this is like a special fraternity. Only you guys have lived through this. Only you saw this. Only you have experienced the aftermath of this. What, what, what does it feel like knowing that you got to spend some time with these guys, share your story? And, and do you think we'll be here again in 30 years? Will people be this fascinated? Should we do this again in 30 more years? <laughs> Well, <laughs> well it's, first of all, it's cathartic to be around everybody. Obviously, uh, we all became sort of connected to a, a tragedy about two young people that lost their life, which is what it was always about, Nicole and Ron. And uh, that's what it's always been about. Uh, I didn't know Ron, but I knew Nicole. She was a beacon of light, and I'm sure that Ron is also a beacon of light. But um, as far as 30 years ago, I think uh, it's always going to be around because it's the template of any, any trial that goes on in America now. They always look at the Simpson trial. So the Simpson trial is going to go on 10, 15, 20. It'll always be. It's going to be in the history books. So... It's always going to be there, and we'll always be connected from here. Even when we pass on, we'll always be um, connected to this in, in history books. So yep. uh, I just also want to say, Tom, thanks. Uh, uh, our show has just been cathartic to people and getting out emotions like this, and thank our guests so much. Yep. And um, I think I'm out of battery. But anyways. <laughs> okay, go recharge. <laughs> Alan, thank Lord. you. Alan, any last final yeah. word that you want to have? No, I mean, I just, I, it's, as we can say, we still can't believe that it's been 30 years, you know, sometimes um, I remember it like it was yesterday. Um, I still get the feelings, it gives me goosebumps talking to Cato, because you could still just put yourself in that night. And then other times it feels like it was just another life ago. So to get together, it definitely brings back a lot of memories and uh, good to see that everybody's here and doing well. Okay, guys. Well, I'm so glad that we could pull this off and make this happen. I can't thank you enough. Um, you know, it's going to be a crazy week. There's going to be a lot of stuff in the media, but at least we have this. And, and tell everybody to watch this because this was a kind of a historic thing to get you all guys together. So from me and Cato, thank you so much. Great job. And we will talk again, okay? Thank you. Um,
Bye. Yep. Okay, that was an all-star panel, and we have two more shows coming up later this week. This is the saga, the O.J. Simpson saga on the 30-year anniversary, presented by American Hartford Gold. We want to thank them for helping make this all possible. Go back in our archive on our YouTube channel and find the individual stories on everybody you just saw today. And make sure you're watching on the 15th and the 17th because two more big episodes are dropping that, that cover the entire week of the saga. And go back into our audio archives too. If you're in your car, you want to hear this again, you're going to find that there's so many details flying around that you need a couple times to, uh, to process that and hear it, and, and, and you'll enjoy that as well. Our community page on our YouTube channel has got information every single day. Make sure you follow Cato on social media. He's got some big things coming up. I'll keep you updated on everything going on with the show and in my life and some of the other projects that we have. And, and that's about it. So thank you so much for watching One Degree of Scandalous with the one and only Kato Kalin. I'm Tom Zenner. And if you enjoyed this episode like I know you did, go back here and watch the entire story that Skip Junis has of being a witness at LAX and enjoy this full story with Alan Park that we had a few weeks ago. Thanks for watching, everybody. I'm Tom Zenner. We'll catch you later. Hey, everybody. Our three-part special on the OJ saga is brought to you by our very good friends at American Hartford Gold. While we like the shocking world of celebrity scandal, don't let financial scandals threaten your retirement funds. We're all feeling the bite of soaring inflation. But our financial future is endangered by a host of other problems, like failing banks, astronomical national debt, and a looming recession. It almost feels criminal, but fortunately, there is a way to protect your hard-earned retirement savings, physical gold and silver. And when it comes to diversifying your savings and tangible assets, I trust American Hartford Gold, and you should too. Whether you want physical gold and silver delivered right to your door or prefer a tax-advantaged gold IRA, they've got you covered. Their customer service is top-notch. It's amazing, guiding you every single step of the way. And here's the best part. When you mention my name, Tom, you'll receive up to $15,000 worth of free silver on qualifying purchases. Gold Gold has been hitting record highs and shows no signs of stopping, making now the perfect time to secure your nest egg. So don't wait. Call 866-718-8939 or text TOM, T-O-M, to 998899 for your free gold information kit today. Again, that's 866-718-8939 or simply text TOM to 998899. Protect your savings with American Hartford Gold.